Hello, this is Lori McLean. I am the co-founder of Fuse Literary, a literary agency that is virtual, that is reinventing what literary agencies are uh, for the future. Anyway, today I thought I would give you a talk about the very basic ideas of what an, a literary agency can and cannot do for you, um, what agents do on a regular basis, um, what makes a good agent, um, percentages, deals, just a basic understanding of working with an agent. So pardon me if I read some of this and you see my eyes go down to my paper, but that's the only way I can think of to do this uh, right now, using my iPhone. Uh, we're all staying at home like we should here in California, and, um, and I want to respect that. Okay, so at the most basic level, a literary agent is an author's business partner. An agent locates a publisher interested in buying an author's writing and then negotiates a deal. And that's what most people think of when they think of a literary agent, if they think of us at all. Uh, but a literary agent is so much more than that. An agent is a scout who constantly researches what publishers are looking for. I'd say this is about I don't know how I spend maybe a quarter of my time. It, it ebbs and flows, but it's a big um, part of my time because editors continually change what they're looking for. Um, an agent is an advocate for an author and his or her work. Sometimes if you write cross genre or you write um, multiple genres, it's important that an agent um, describe that and articulate that to the editors so they know that if they're looking for a work for hire or um, they need a mystery author and a romance author, that you might be the person for that. An agent's a midwife who assists in the birth of a writing project. Absolutely. I am constantly helping my authors down that last stretch when they're pushing that novel out. Um, an agent's a reminder who keeps the author on track if things begin to slip. You know, some of my clients are really good at meeting deadlines. Others have to be coaxed continuously um, to get it done. And when they do finally finish it, it's amazing stuff. But, you know, they're constantly saying, can, can we extend that deadline another two months? And it really plays havoc with um, a publisher's schedule. So we try not to do it. Um, an, it, an agent is an editor for that last push before submission. I mean, it's great to use beta readers and all that, but an agent is just one level up from beta readers, much more professional. They know what editors are going to be looking for. So whether it's, you know, polishing it for typos or uh, continuity or even, um, you know, that the ending wasn't as dramatic as it could have been or the, the opening scene is too um, confusing, you know, things like that. Uh, a critic who will tell authors what they need to hear in order to improve. You also don't get that from a lot of your critique partners or beta readers or even friends or relatives um, who think you are just awesome that you could complete a book, but an agent needs to sell the book. So, and, and if you start believing your own hype, say you become a bestseller with your first book and you just think you're fantastic, you kind of gloss over and forget all the steps you took to get there in the first place. And an agent's really good at reminding you of those things. Um, a matchmaker who knows the exact editors for an author's type of writing. I've got to say, that's that makes me the happiest um, when I read something from one of my clients and say, I know exactly who this is right for. So yeah, that's, a, that's important. Um, a negotiator who will fight to get the best deal for an author. Authors are usually um, creative people, and they do not like confrontation, uh, except if it's on the page, of course. Um, but an editor, think of it like the author is the creative engine of the partnership, and the agent is the business engine. So you can pretty much leave all of that negotiating um, and hardball uh, conversations to your agent, and, um, and, and just concentrate on the, on the creative aspect of writing yourself. Um, an agent's a mediator who can step in between the author and publisher to fix problems. This happens more than you might think that, um, may, you know, it's the classic one is I hate the cover or they're making me change my client's name or my uh, character's name, but it doesn't always have to be that big. It could be having to do with word count. It could be having to do with, um, 
character names being too similar to each other, perhaps, and so they want something to change, or or it could be um, that another book just came out and was a bestseller, and it went over a lot of the same ground, so they want it to change. Um, so your agent is, again, you want to have a good relationship with the editor. The agent is expected to go in there and negotiate, mediate, deal with all the problems that might crop up. Hopefully they won't, but they could. Um, an agent is a reality check if an author gets out of sync with the real world. And a lot of times this can happen when you do a long series or a group of series. Um, one really great example is the, the YA or young adult market. When it started out, it was real sweet, you know, Sweet Valley High and all those kind of things. But if Sweet Valley High would probably be a middle grade book, if that. Um, when when uh, YA came out 40 years ago, it was um, it was new and it was experimental and everything was great. But now teens are being exposed to so much more in the media, in social media, on television. Um, and so they're much more aware of problems from the global level down onto the personal level. So it's not um, whereas, you know, 10 years ago, having a sex scene in a YA novel would have been forbidden. Now it's not. Same thing with swearing or drinking or doing drugs. So an agent really keeps an eye on what's going on, reads all the best-selling books in the genres that he or she represents, and can give that kind of advice to uh, clients. A liaison between the publishing community and the author. Um, at Fuse, we tend to be very heavily into social media, author branding, and we make sure that um, the author's community of readers, of um, editors and potential buyers of their work, um, of their colleagues who you might want to get um, pull quotes from or endorsements and um, blurbs. So we're aware of all of that and trying to manage that community with you um, so that you can use it effectively. I mean, think about the situation we're all in right now where everybody has to stay at home and everything's done online instead of person to person. Uh, if you already know who your readers are and you've been communicating with them on Twitter or Facebook or an Instagram or whatever, it's so easy to pivot into doing more of that. Whereas if you haven't at all, then um, it's, it's going to be a much more difficult uh, transition. Um, an agent is the cheerleader for an author's work or style. I love um, authors who think outside the covers and write things that are not just rehashes of things that have gone before. But that makes it a lot harder to find the perfect editor um, to, to buy a, a client's work. So, but that is my job, to be a cheerleader for all my authors. And if you follow me at Agent Savant on Twitter, you will see that most of my posts are, most of my tweets are about my clients and how great they are. Um, an agent is a focal point for subsidiary foreign and dramatic rights. Uh, I used to have audio rights in there uh, as well, but that has changed to where publishers want the audio rights because they're so profitable right now. Um, but any kind of subsidiary right, um, an agent can sell. And this works well for self-published authors, too, because you keep all your rights. You don't you don't uh, license any of them to a large publisher. So um, that's something that an agent can do. A mentor who will assist in developing an author's career. Yeah, we're in it for the long haul. Um, I don't know too many agents who just want to do a one-off. They want to sell one book for you, and then they're out. Mostly, they're trying to build your career um, so that both of you have an income for a long time to come. An agent is a rainmaker who can get additional writing work for an author. I just sold a six-figure, what they call an IP deal. IP stands for intellectual property. It's where a, um, a publisher, or in this case, a large media company, they feel that they've got a, an idea and they create a world, they create the characters, they create what they call a Bible, which has all the elements in it. They're just looking for someone to write their work. And usually you could be expected for in a work for hire project like that to get a few thousand dollars. But now they're reaching out to best selling authors and they're willing to pay uh, the going rate to get um, really good work uh, for their IP work for hire. So 
agents are clued into that and can help their clients take advantage of that. An agent is a career coach for all aspects of your writing future, especially if you want to do different things than what you made a name in. Um, we can build a plan for how to make that happen. Um, an educator about changes in the publishing industry. I mean, since 2008, um, let's see. Fuse was formed in 2013, but in 2008, everything changed. That's when um, Amazon came out with the Kindle and with KDP um, for an easy way to get your eBooks up there. Smashwords came out with uh, distribution to anything that was not on Amazon and social media made it uh, viable for you to promote yourselves without spending a lot of money. So that caused a lot of ripple effects throughout the traditional publishing industry. And as an agent, I was able to work both sides of it so that I was uh, informing the publishers what I felt would be a good path going forward and also making sure that my clients were, you know, ready for this kind of a huge, huge change. I mean, publishing hadn't changed really in 200 years. So this was good. And finally, um, a manager of the business side of your writing life. I, I mentioned that before. Okay, so what are some qualities of agents uh, that you might want to consider if you're looking for an agent? You want to interview agents um, as you would a publicist, an indie editor, or a cover designer if you are self-published because you want a great team around you, right? So an agent is part of that team. Make sure the agent has integrity, wisdom, which is different, knowledge, um, strong work ethic, a personality fit. You're going to have to work with this person, hopefully for a long time. I have some clients who my relationship with them has lasted longer than their marriages. So um, you want to make sure that your personalities work together. The other thing is um, agents, kind of the extremes are you might have a shark of an agent. They don't want to talk to you unless they've got a deal on the table. And so you never hear from them unless that happens. Yet they're going to get you the absolute last cent out of, they're going to squeeze it out of every deal. And on the other end, you've got an agent who's more like psychotherapist and a friend and um, an editorial agent who wants to look at everything in the first draft and offer commentary and all that. So um, a personality fit, you know, I, I tell my clients before their clients to do a uh, an audit of yourself as an author, your strengths and weaknesses. And whatever your strengths are, that's great. Whatever your weaknesses are, you want to make sure you have a business partner, aka an agent, who... Um, you know, dovetails like this, your, your strengths, their strengths, and they go together. Um, you want an agent who has a personal commitment to their profession. You don't want to have an agent who's in it and out of it really quickly. A lot of times when there are layoffs at publishers, editors will say, well, I want to be an agent. And yet they find out that it, it takes a while to make money as an agent. Um, and maybe it's too slow for them. Uh, and they don't like the sales part of it or whatever. And then they're out of it within one or two years. So you want to make sure that not only are they committed to being an agent, but also are committed to the work that needs to be done to um, keep up with um, that the agenting knowledge that you need. You know, not only which editors are buying what kinds of books, but what are the changes in publishing and what are the changes in agenting that um, that they need to know about. And finally, that they're, they're going to have a personal relationship with you. And so... Um, you, you, you want to research them beforehand and make sure that they have all the qualities that I just mentioned. Um, a lot of people ask me at conferences what makes a great client agent team because it really is a lot of teamwork. Um, it helps when you enter a relationship to know what you want to get out of it and to be able to articulate this to your agent business partner. What I mean there is be realistic with yourself. Sit down and say, what do I need an agent for? You might be self-publishing, you might be very successful, you say, I don't need one. Or you might say, well, I'm not doing too well at um, selling the subsidiary rights. I haven't gotten many foreign translations, there's no movies or TV shows being made out of my books, um, and I think there should be. <clears throat> so this is, um, you know, know this, know what you want to get out of the relationship before you get into it. Do you want someone to hold your hand or a shark who will get you the last time possible from a book contract? They're usually not the same. They're not the same personality types. 
Um, do you want an editing agent to help you polish your work prior to submitting to editors? Or do you want a strict business-oriented agent who will concentrate solely on pitching your work and negotiating deals on your behalf? I don't want to beat a dead horse, but basically this is important to think about before you even start to put together a list of agents um, to try and pitch to or query. Do you want someone who's fun to work with or do you prefer a no-nonsense, results-oriented personality? Did I just say that the second time through? Probably. Um, once you build a profile for what you want in an agent, you improve the probability that the agent will become your partner and they'll work out well long-term. Okay, how do you find an agent? So you, now you've, you've done your personal audit. You know what your strengths and weaknesses are as an author. You've figured out what you want in an agent. You're ready to go. Okay, where do you find one? You know, unless they're, they're sitting right next to you, it's pretty hard. Um, but basically, it's not because it's all online. Uh, there's an agency website. Every single agency has a website. I think there are one or two who still don't, but that's because they're, you know, they've been in business for so long. Everybody knows who they are and they're representing estates of authors and they're really not looking for too many new clients. So as a newbie author, that's probably not the first place you want to stop anyway, but an agency website. And then, um, uh, every agent has social media. They might not do them all, but I guarantee they're on Twitter and Facebook. They probably have a blog. They might be on Instagram. Um, find them. You know, you just search for them and you will find them. And in fact, they probably have everything listed on how you can contact them or follow them on their website. Um, there are also two, actually three, search engines you can use. QueryTracker.net, AgentQuery.com, and Submittable, with two Ts, .com. Those three are where, you, they're like search engines for agents. You create a list, you, you check off what your book is about. So you do mysteries for young adults um, and then you hit search and it will come back with a list of, you know, a hundred or so agents. And that's really your first step. I, I advise people to um, take 10% of the time it took you to write your book and invest that in finding your hopefully lifelong business partner and the perfect agent for you. So once you get that list of 100 agents, possible agents, then search a little more, go to their website, um, lurk on their social media and find out what their personalities are, see what you know, what deals they're crowing about lately and their, how they treat their clients. Um, the other thing you could do while you're creating this list to do research is there's a place called publishersmarketplace.com. And this is agents subscribe for the year because that's where they list all the deals that any agent does. So we're all superstars in there and we're also looking for who else um, represents books that, you know, so we can we can talk to them at conferences and say, hey, I just see you just sold this, this is really great. But also to see what editors are buying. It's a great research tool for us. It's $25 a month. So I'm not saying sign up for a year for it. You really only need it for a month. You need it for a month and then you look through all the agents on the list that you prepared. Very quickly you will see who's selling and who's not. Um, that's how you find an agent. Now, then, of course, you have to go through the whole process of querying them or pitching them in person if you go to an event, if we ever get out of our homes again. Um, um, but, you know, at that point, you'll have a pretty good idea of what an agent does and what they charge and um, which, which agents would be the right personality matches for you, as well as, you know, ones who have sold deals lately. So what do agents charge? Um, agents get 15% of any deal that they create. Um, this is publishing deals. So for primary rights, which is uh, for a publishing deal these days, it's print book, ebook and audiobook. That's that's a deal breaker if you don't want to license all three of those things. Um, and then the subsidiary rights after that, which I mentioned earlier, dramatic, which is you know Hollywood stuff, um, foreign translations. Um, I mean, they have things like theme parks. They have things like merchandise. They, they have lots of possible subsidiary rights. Video games, um, enhanced ebooks you know, with, with all kinds of things. Um, those are 20 to 30%, normally because uh, your main agent will probably farm that out to an agent that specializes just in that subsidiary, right? We work with uh, the APA agency, for example, who has offices in New York and LA, and they only concentrate on books to film. 
And for foreign rights, we work with Baror International, who's done a lot of work. Um, they have a whole network of foreign agencies that they deal with in country, in each country, to get books for foreign translations, English language books translated into foreign languages. Um, the reason it's 20 to 30 percent and why it's kind of wiggly in contracts is because um, sometimes countries are harder to deal with than other countries or they're more complicated. One of those is China. Uh, they they charge 20% just up front. So if you're dealing with an agent, you know, your primary agent and your co-agent, and they only get 5% of each of those because the, the Chinese structure um, and government gets most of that. They get the 20%. Now, what else do agents charge? Um, sometimes out-of-pocket expenses, although I've been an agent for 15 years, sold all these books you see on this bookshelf and there's another bookshelf out in the hall. Um, and I have never ever charged a client for out of pocket expenses. Now, if you're a nonfiction author and you have original photographs and artwork and, and things like this that have to accompany your text overseas, perhaps, um, yeah, there might be some mailing charges that go along with that. But the charges that older agents used to charge really don't apply anymore because most everything's done on the phone and email. Um, you don't fax anything, you email it. You don't, um, you know, courier anything, you email it. So I don't see much of what you would have to worry about in that case. But if you see that an agency in their contract wants to charge you a fee of $500 a month just to cover their expenses, you should run away from that because that's... That's how they're probably making most of their money. Also, along those lines, never ever pay an agent a reading fee. This is something that we do to find new clients. So, you know, you should never pay an agent to read your work or even edit it if that's what you want. And never, ever, ever pay an agent for something you self-publish. So if you find an agent and in their contract, it says, you know, even if you self-publish something, we get 15%. Again, do not sign that contract. Cross it off. I mean, they haven't done anything to earn that. So they shouldn't get the 15%. I know not a lot of other agents are going to disagree with me on that. But I feel very strongly that unless I bring value to the table, um, I should not get paid for that. Now, the one the one thing you might want to do, though, that I mentioned earlier is if you um, self-publish a book and you want your an agent to sell sub rights, that's fine. Um, we have a lot of what I call hybrid authors. I'll get into that in more detail later. But those people, when they self-publish, um, we have an addendum to our contract for each book that they um, want us to try and sell sub rights. Um, OK, the process. How do you get an agent? So you can pitch agents at conferences and online events. That's pretty straightforward. You can write a great query letter that shows off your vo voice. Um, I like the structure, the hook, the book, the cook. The hook is the log line, the high concept that gets an agent's attention. And the book is a little bit of an expansion on that. Not much, one or two paragraphs at the most. And then the cook is just about you as an author. If you've won awards, if you're a bestseller, if you know certain people in the industry, if you've got a blurb from a bestselling author that will help your agent sell the book, those are things you should mention there. Don't mention in your bio that, you know, you're a, you're a fifth grade teacher and your kids love um, the book that you write if it has nothing to do with teaching or for that age group. Um, Polish your first three chapters, around 50 pages, because um, you might get asked for that right away and you want to have it to send out right away. And don't start this process of pitching until your manuscript is complete, edited, and polished. Or for nonfiction, you must have a book proposal. And if you don't know what that is, you need to find out. Not memoir. I'm talking about nonfiction like political nonfiction, business nonfiction, cookbooks, travel guides, things like that. Um, a memoir is treated much more like fiction in the way that it's sold. It's sold more like a novel. But make sure it's complete, edited, and polished. Don't just do NaNoWriMo for the month of November and then um, you know as soon as you write the end send that 50,000 words off to an agent in fact Fuse Literary has closed <laughs> two submissions in December a lot of it is because of that purpose we were getting flooded with NaNoWriMo uh, novels that were just not polished you know great books are not written they're rewritten so think about that okay so 
queries and pitches. Pitching is in person and queries are usually via email. So if you're going to create a super query to get an agent, what do you do? Um, make it personal. If you've learned something by following them on Twitter or Facebook or you read about it in Publishers Weekly or Publishers Marketplace, you know, you might want to start saying, hey, I, I heard that you just sold this deal. Congratulations. My book is nothing like that, but... Um, but I see that by doing deals, you know, you're you're a you're a good agent or something. Whatever, one sentence to to make it personal. Of all the pitches and queries I get, maybe five percent um, say something personal. Otherwise, everybody creates one query and they send it to everybody, and that's it. And you know, that's too bad. Um, it's like the request for proposal. Uh, philosophy of doing that rather than making it personal so the agent goes from hmm yeah to oh wow that's nice it's just a, again relationship building make it interesting of course make it brief and powerful when I read queries and and take pitches well let's just talk about queries because that's more how you would be um, involved with me especially since we're all at home right now um, when I read queries, it's always at night or on the weekends. I'm married. I would like to see my husband from time to time, but I work about 10 hours a day. And then I'm too exhausted after that to do much of anything except veg on the couch and watch TV or, uh, you know, do Facebook stuff or whatever. So I'm looking to get through these and reject as quickly as I can. It, it's going to take something really special to get my attention. So um, by making it brief and making it powerful, you've got a much better chance that I'm going to read the query, be interested, and immediately start to read some of your work. That's what you want to have happen. Get through that query letter, bam, get right into the work. Because that's really what it's all about. You could be great at writing query letters and you could be crummy as a writer of a novel. So. Um, it's a weird process. I would love to figure out a different way to do it, but I haven't so far. And I've been at this for 15 years, so I'm not sure I'm ever going to make it. Um, eliminate all grammatical errors. Yes, it's cool to run spell check, but spell check cannot determine the difference between T-H-E-Y apostrophe R-E, T-H-E-R-E, and T-H-E-I-R. So if you have a friend who's good at that, Make sure you pass all your, your query letters, your manuscripts, everything, your partials that you're going to submit through someone with a good proofreading eye, even if it's a spouse that, you know, reads a lot. <laughs> Mention any referrals you have, um, especially if they're a client. If I get a, um, a query from someone who says, I'm best friends with Julie Kagawa, one of my best-selling clients, then I'm going to read that right away. I'm not going to wait because... Um, I want to be, you know, if Julie calls me the next week, I want to be able to say, oh, I read the query from your friend, and it was really good. The last one's kind of silly, but you wouldn't believe how many people spell agents' names wrong. Spell the agent's name right. My name is Lori, L-A-U-R-I-E. My last name has a capital M, a small c, and a capital L-E-A-N. Um, I get Mr. McLean, because they don't know if Lori's female or um, male. I get M-C-C-L-E-A-N, so Mick Clean rather than Mick Lean all the time. Um, it just shows an attention to detail that makes me, you know, instead of, it makes me open to reading. It, it's not a speed bump, speed bump. Okay, the who, what, and where of manuscript pitching. Knowing where a manuscript fits should be a part of any good agent's knowledge base. A good agent knows which editors want what material, and even better, a good agent knows what they don't want. So um, when you're pitching a manuscript, any help you can give an agent, again, eliminates these speed bumps. So if you say, this is these are the two comp books that I think my book is like, um, a lot of time it's a juxtaposition of two different things that creates a third thing, and that third thing is your book. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if you say uh, it, it's, a, it's a combination of these two things and I think it'd be great for this market, again, it's just putting some context into a query so an agent as a salesperson can say, hmm, I'm interested because four or five editors this month have told me they're looking for this. Um, if it's an IP or work for hire that you're looking for, again, you want an agent who has sold a lot of that. 
Um, if the mainstream market considerations, an agent needs to know that if your book is very niche and you identify it as such, then a lot of agents, if they don't represent that niche, they're not going to be interested at all. And, and a lot of times you don't know that until you query them. It's not something that we talk about a lot on social media or um, that you would find in publishers marketplace. Um, just know that cross-genre and exploratory work will be harder to sell, but some agents are all over that, and that makes their day. So that's the agent you want to find. Don't forget regional, mid-sized specialty, and university presses. These are, these are places that you could even pitch without an agent. So rather than just knee-jerk self-publish something, maybe a university press or a regional press. You know, if it's about Bigfoot and it happens in the Pacific Northwest, there are several regional press presses up there that you could be pitching to directly who might buy it from you directly. And then you can hire either an agent or a lawyer, an IP lawyer, to go over the contract that they give you. Regarding lawyers, just a quick aside here. If you want a lawyer to work to look at a publishing contract, make sure it's an intellectual property lawyer, not your buddy who's a real estate lawyer or a cousin who's a, you know, corporate lawyer um, or a trademark attorney or something like that. They don't understand publishing contracts, and you, and whenever that happens with a new client, it's so obvious to me immediately because the things that they're cutting out will be the same things that you encounter in a publishing contract. So in an agency agreement, if they're, you know, <laughs> trying to get rid of some things that they're going to see down the road in a publishing agreement, it's kind of a red flag to agents. And there's always self-publishing. I mean, the biggest joy in my life was 2008 when self-publishing stopped being a vanity press and it started being a real business. Um, because I hate not being able to give creative people an outlet and an alternative. Um, you know, if you can self-publish and make a name for yourself that way, that's fantastic. The other thing is I used to think of publishing as um, a, uh, not a castle, but maybe a keep. And there's a moat and there's all, all these impediments to getting inside. And you have to just keep bashing down that front door to get in. And that's what you do, book after book after book that you write. But now I look at it like an, a ladder. And you've got self-publishing as one side and you've got um, traditional publishing on the other. And there are all of these rungs in between. And at any point, you might go back and forth, actually, too. I have a, a lot of hybrid authors, and they do both self-publishing and traditional publishing. And they will probably continue to do that throughout their entire career because they have different things that they're interested in writing. And, um, and I love them because I have lots of sources of income. I can sell them to a traditional publisher and get a lot of money. I can also work at building their brand by um, selling subsidiary rights and also helping them um, you know, edit their books and, and, and see how all of this disparate stuff works into a career plan for them. Okay, agent editor friendships. Inevitably, when you're working with someone a lot and over a great number of years, close relationships will result in friendships. Online friendships, in person friendships. Hey, agents and editors all love good books and we read continuously and, um, and we work on books together and it's wonderful. But great writing trumps trumps friendships boy I have a hard time saying that word trumps friendships every time I could go to my best friend in New York give them something and unless the writing is fantastic it's not going to matter they're going to say no so just just know that if an agent says to you oh yeah I'm in New York I got great friends on all the big five it's wonderful it's a it's an opportunity it's a, an advantage but it doesn't matter if you're not writing exactly what they need how long do I wait after I, um, well, how long do you wait after you pitch um, your manuscript? It really varies on an agent's style and workload, which fluctuates throughout the year. Um, it's usually listed on their website. I know that most of our agents, it's four to six weeks, but it could be longer. Like right now, it's probably shorter because everybody's home and they don't have meetings to go to and they don't have travel time. So they're pouring that back into their work. You can check a lot of this information on agentquery.com and querytracker.net. They have lots of stats on agent response times. They're not always correct, but at least it gives you an idea. Um, the time of year can shorten or lengthen uh, between the query and response. But at this point, when you're just starting out, you query far and wide. You query everybody. Maybe not 
all 100 people at the same time, maybe start with 20. Um, prioritize your groups and then do 20 at a time. Wait a couple weeks, a month, query the next 20 because you might get some feedback that will cause you to either change your pitch or change your um, uh, the manuscript a little bit, edit the manuscript. So, but, but do far and wide at this point, don't give anybody exclusives or if there's somebody that you really do want to give an exclusive and they've asked for one, limit it to two weeks. They really want to read your manuscript. They can read it in two weeks. And if they say, no, it's got to be three months, don't do it because that's effectively taking you off the market for three months. Um, the other thing I would suggest, here's a little trick, is that you should, um, in your query letter, at the end, you say, I noticed uh, from agentquery.com that your typical reading time is four to six weeks. So I will send you um, an email at after six weeks um, if I don't hear back from you by then. That's usually all you will need to get an agent to read something. We don't like to be embarrassed in public or in private. Um, okay, so by doing all these great things, you're gonna get an agent. And when you get one, what next? What does an agent, agent need to get started? Well, I have never had a manuscript come in from a client um, that I haven't put my two cents on top of, whether it's you know a quick uh, copy edit where I'm proofreading it, or whether I'm trying to tell them, hmm, this middle's still a little mushy. Here are some suggestions of things you can do. I'm sure you can come up with others. Uh, maybe it needs to be tightened. Maybe it needs to be expanded, whatever it is. But I'll need a full, complete, polished manuscript, the best that you can make it. Um, on top of that, the first two things we do with an, with an author, which I, I can only speak for Fuse, I can't speak for other agencies, but we do, as soon as we sign someone, we do a social media audit, meaning we look through all of the social media properties, make sure they're consistent, make sure they, um, they, they, people will know they're from the same person and maybe they're all listed on your website. And also do an author branding session because it's not enough anymore to say I write paranormal romance or I write cozy mysteries or I write um, science fiction thrillers. You have to dig down deeper than that. And, and it's a lot of what if questions. Tell me more, tell me more, tell me more until we get to that branding statement. But the nice thing is even with I had a client once who pretty much wrote everything. He wrote poetry. He still does. Poetry, uh, science fiction, fantasy, mysteries, thrillers, um, literary works. And he said, I write every morning for two hours and I write whatever I feel like writing. So it might be working on a novel. After that's over, maybe I'm right. Oh, he also wrote nonfiction. So he was an engineer. So he might be writing about that. He might be writing science fiction in a far flung universe. He might be writing fantasy in the Middle Ages. Um, and what we found out by doing this author branding session was that every single one of his projects that he had done, every one of the books that he'd written had been about the man versus, you know, the organization, the corrupt government, the interstellar galactic force, whatever it was, but it was always the individual winning out over the corrupt, um, group. So that was a really, that's probably my favorite author branding session. And it actually took us three times, three two hour sessions, because it was so, so hard to get to that. But it, what it also did was it was a revelation for him. So now in his writing, he knows that's going to be a central part of his writing moving forward, whatever he does. So he comes up with the ideas really quickly. And, and he knows that's, you know, that's going to be the, the bulk of his book. The themes of his book are going to be that. So that was cool. And then we build an author platform. We figure out what colors, what um, length of text, what uh, messaging needs to go on everything from your website to your business cards to your um, Amazon author page um, to your Twitter bio, everything like that. We make it consistent and it really helps editors because when they decide they want to buy a book from an agent, they... Um, they go look up the author online and they see what, it, what are your social media numbers and uh, what's your image out there. And, uh, and it helps if it's cohesive. All right, I promised you I would tell you more about what a hybrid author was. I have a feeling that a lot of you might be self-published authors or you might be new and you might not know yet um, a lot about the industry. Hybrid authors, I believe, and this is me, 
this is me saying as one person, a lot of other agents do not like um, hybrid authors. But a hybrid author is indie published, self-published, and traditionally published. But also more than that, indie authors have a different mindset. They tend to be more knowledgeable about the whole publishing process. I mean, before 2008, most of my authors didn't care about publishing other than to get their checks and to get their books out there. Yes, they wanted their books marketed well too by the, their publishers, but they didn't really understand the process of how it worked. They didn't understand from them turning into manuscript how that became a book. They didn't understand what the sales force of a publisher does or how it gets to the bookstore or how the bookstores sell them how they're warehoused, what happens if a book doesn't sell? Does it go back to the warehouse? Does it come back to the publisher? All these things they didn't know. Well, guess what? Now they do. Indie authors are were leading that charge where they put so much information up that even traditionally published authors now understand the process. Um, agents help on both fronts for hybrid authors. So whether you've self-published or traditionally published, working an agent intimately into that team is a really smart move. Um, we also at Fuse have agency assisted self-publishing. We have some authors who say, I just, I don't get it. I don't want to get it. I don't want to have to go out and find a cover designer and an interior designer and a back cover blurb creator and somebody who's going to edit, do a developmental edit, another person who's going to do a proofreading session or a line editing session. And I don't want to have to spend the money up front to, to make all those things happen. Um, so what we did is we figured out a way through our, our assisted self-publishing arm, uh, Short Fuse Publishing. It used to be that it was, we'd get your book out there in 60 days. Um, and we still do, but Short Fuse is more that we're using it for our clients only. Um, so you can't, you know, treat Short Fuse as a, a an open publisher, but we use this for our clients when they have something that may be outside the genre they have been become known in, or it might be short, or it might be epic in length, it might be poetry, it might be um, secondary stories that support the books that are traditionally published. Um, that's a lot of times I'll, I'll hold anything less than a novel length fiction out of the publishing agreements, uh, the publishing contracts. That way my, my uh, clients can publish either with short fuse or self publish, um, because their fan base doesn't want to wait a year in between books with nothing. I also believe that in five years, all authors will be hybrids of some sort. I mean, Stephen King is notorious for trying out new media on exclusive basis. Um, he did when uh, the Kindle came out. He was the first author. He did a, a pen to piece called Ur, U R, uh, it was a short story, and it was exclusively on the Kindle. You had William Gibson, who wrote Neuromancer, do a book that every time you read a page, the page before it erased. So the book was erasing itself as you read through. It was really cool ideas like that. So that's hybrid publishing. All right, I'm winding down here. I only have a couple more slides. But one of the things that I do get asked at conferences a lot is what makes a bad client? What what makes a bad client, you know, author uh, in the agency author relationship? And it really boils down to this. Poor communication skills. If you don't return my emails and you don't talk to me for months at a time, um, a lot of times that, uh, that makes us grow further apart and it's harder to keep that energy between us going. One trick ponies. If you really, you know, maybe you're older and you really only want to write a memoir. One memoir, you want it for your family, um, but that's all you're ever going to do. Um, an agent, most agents, but definitely me, I want five books out of you at a rate of one per year. So if you don't think you have five books, you probably are, don't waste your time getting an agent. Just do it all yourself. Um, if you have an exaggerated evaluation of your skill set, <laughs> that's about as nicely as I could put it. If you've got an overinflated raging ego and you think you're the next JK Rowling or Neil Gaiman, then um, we're probably not going to work well together because I'm humbler than that. And even though I've had, I, I've sold more than 200 books in my career, but I don't, I don't come across as uh, demanding or a diva or, uh, you know, like with an overinflated ego. So I tend to look for clients that are like that too. I like you to be humble, even if you're a bestseller. 
because, um, well, my, my favorite uh, cartoon shows a man and a woman standing on a, um, a cliff that's looking over an ingress and ingress of a marina. And you've got a uh, one-person dinghy, you've got a two-person day sailor, you've got a nice little, you know, sailboat, and then you've got a yacht. And the caption is, I want one of those. Because that's normally how it works. You start out and you just like, I just want to get published. And then pretty soon you get published. And then you want to be uh, getting more money. And then you get more money. And then you want to be a bestseller. And you become a bestseller. And then you want to be the number one bestseller. Um, so it's almost, there's no end to it. And if you have an exaggerated sense of your skill set starting out, there's no upside to it. So think about that. If a, if a client can't meet deadlines, um, that's going to be a problem. And it's, it's a problem that we need to fix right away with that first book and figure out why. Is it a psychological barrier? Is it a time barrier? Whatever it is, and try and eliminate it. Um, if you make a social media faux pas, or I don't know what the plural of that would be, but if you're constantly haranguing on social media, um, some editors might be scared away by that. Not that I'm trying to, you know horse collar anyone or, or censor you, but just know that whatever your views are, if it's totally separate from your, um, what you write about, you know, if you're a political nonfiction author and you want to rage about whatever area of politics it is that you're writing about, that's fine. That's building your brand. But if you're a, um, romance novelist and you're raging against the current administration, you know, maybe half your readers like the current administration. So that might not be too smart. Anyway, it's just one thing, you know, that I think makes a bad client. And the last one is, this does not make you a bad client. Ignorance of the publishing process does not make you a bad client. A lot of people think it does. Well, I'm, I don't know anything, so I can't imagine an agent who would take me on. No, you, you will learn. And it's a process. It's a journey. Like Steve Jobs said, the journey is the reward. It's not the destination. So you have to think about that going through. Okay, I think I'm on my last page. Yes. So I want to leave you with this. The most important thing about working with an agent. Agents should be pursued as business partners and evaluated as such. If you can't interest an agent in your work, you can always publish with a smaller regional press who accepts direct submissions or indie publish, self-market, and prove yourself that way. Agents need writers as much as writers need agents, perhaps even more. So think of agents as plumbers or um, gardeners or um, a tax accountant. You know, somebody that you would go to to help you with a skill set that you don't have and you don't want to have. Um, they will help you get more money for your books. They will help you build a career and a brand. And hopefully you'll really like working with them and it'll be a long relationship. So how do you get in touch with me? My uh, website is fuseliterary.com. That's F-U-S-E, like the fuse on a stick of dynamite, literary.com. My uh, agency Twitter handle is at Fuse Literary. My personal one is at agent savant it's like idiot savant except with agent at the front uh beforehand because i thought when i started being an agent 15 years ago i knew a lot about a lot of things but not a lot about agenting um i have a blog i don't keep it up very much anymore because we have a really active blog on the agency website so i'll give it to you so you can have a historical perspective if you like and that's agentsavant.com but our um our agent, our Fuse Literary, um, I guess, uh, it's not really a newsletter, it says news, but it's a blog, and that can be found at fuseliterary.com slash blog. Um, that's where our news is, our client deals, things like that. So I hope this has been helpful. Um, if you have questions about agenting, specific questions, you can email me at lori at uh, fuseliterary.com. That's L-A-U-R-E at F-U-S-E l-i-t-e-r-a-r-y.com and I'll try and answer them. Um, please don't pitch me your book there. Um, I am close to uh, pitches and queries unless I meet you online or at a conference. So I know that's, this is an online conference. Um, I'll tell you what, I'm going to change my mind. 
Right Hive, I want to help them out. So anyone who has lasted this long through this presentation, if you, I, I handle a, a middle grade, young adult, and adult genre fiction. Genre fiction, is, I define it as romance, uh, science fiction, fantasy, and horror, um, thrillers, suspense, and mysteries, and westerns if they're weird. Uh, so things you would find in their own sections in the back of a bookstore. I don't do literary fiction. I don't do um, commercial fiction. I don't do nonfiction. I don't do graphic novels. Um, I don't do memoir. So basically, middle grade, young adult, or adult genre fiction. If you've got something like that, I will uh, read the first 10 pages in a query letter sent to laurie at fuseliterary.com. And in the subject line, make sure you put right hive. Thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoy the conference.